good to be, uh, oh, I forgot how bright these lights are. It's good to be with you this morning to be able to share the Word of God and in this series that we're in right now called Empowered. And uh, Joel kicked it off here a couple of weeks ago talking about why it was better for Jesus to go away so that he could send the Holy Spirit uh, to empower us. And then uh, last week, um, uh, Pastor Jason, he talked about uh, how the Holy Spirit forms and how the Holy Spirit feeds. And both those were great messages uh, to kick off this series. Well, today I want to talk to you about uh, Holy Spirit-empowered faith. How many of you here this morning are God-pleasers? Okay, there's a few of you. Well, I hope that after today that more of you will want to please God. Uh, because in uh, Hebrews 11:6 it says, But without faith it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews 10.38 says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. You know, these are really strong words, aren't they? No pleasure in him. But the whole basis of our Christianity is our faith and what Jesus did on the cross for us. In Romans, it says we're to live by faith. In Corinthians, it says we are to walk by faith and not by sight. In Timothy, it says we're to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold of eternal life. Well, what is faith anyway? Well, if you look up the dictionary definition, we always like to see what the dictionary has first to say about it. It says it's complete trust or confidence in someone or something, strong belief in God or in the doctrines of a religion based on spiritual apprehension rather than proof, inner attitude, connection or trust related human beings to a supreme God or ultimate salvation. But I believe that faith is a choice. I believe that it's a decision to rely on God based on what he's revealed about himself in his creation, in nature, and in the Bible. In Hebrews 11, that's known by Christians as the faith chapter, it says in Hebrews 11.1, 1, and now it gives us the Bible definition of faith, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But before we look at faith in more detail and where we get faith from, let's look at what faith is not. There's a lot of different opinions on faith these days and what it really is, but these are some ones I think that it's not. It's not a magic word. It's not a way to manipulate God into doing what we want. It's not an issue of ordering God around. Faith is not positive thinking or willing something into being simply because you want it to be so. Faith is not denial. It doesn't deny the existence of a problem. Faith is not neglect. It does not neglect responsibilities. Faith is not a formula that God responds to. Faith is not a panic button that we push in times of trouble. It's a lifestyle of trusting in God. Faith does not fluctuate, whether we're in times of blessing or persistent adversity. Faith is based on the word, not on feeling. But faith does not deny the existence of feelings. And when I was talking with Debbie Lachance yesterday about my message, she gave me this quote I thought was so good. If you feel nothing, that's okay. Faith was never a feeling. It's more like a muscle, and muscles don't always feel good. (laughs) I like that one. Faith does not negate the sovereignty of God. Faith is not a momentary act of believing, but a living, enduring uh, trust in God. Well, you know, there are many sides to faith. And there's many kinds of faith that are talked about in the Bible. And I can only touch on a few of them this morning because it's a big topic. And you could talk on each one of these for weeks. In fact, when I was stewing about this message, my husband, he went to his filing cabinet and he pulled out 11 messages on faith to help me out. You know, if if you need help... He's got 50 years of messages in that filing cabinet, and I don't know how many more in his computer, so he's, he's your answer. Uh, well, I didn't use all of his messages, so you know I did my own work, and I just used a little wee bit because I didn't like some of his messages. 
so you don't have to tell them that. Okay, what are the kinds of faith here? First of all, there's natural faith. You have faith in your doctor, your banker, your lawyer. And if you're like me, you really have faith in that pilot when you fly. Well, I don't usually have much faith in him. I just have faith in God. I hate flying. You don't have much faith, I know, in politicians these days and in some spiritual leaders as well, unfortunately. And when you came in this morning, you put your faith in that chair to hold you, right? That's natural faith. Then there's great faith. Jesus' response to this centurion in Matthew who said, Only speak a word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus marveled and he said, I haven't found such great faith in all of Israel. And then there's mustard seed faith. And this is the faith that moves mountains. It's pure. It's an unwavering faith that God can do the impossible for you because little is much when God is in it. Then there's faithless faith. Yeah, the Bible talks about faithless faith. Like Thomas, we have to see it to believe it. Have you ever ever had times when Jesus answered your prayers and you were shocked about it? I I was thinking of the story of of Peter when Herod threw him in prison. And when he was in prison, the whole church was praying for him. And there was house meetings even praying for him. And as a result of their prayers, God sent an angel to, to deliver Peter from prison. He goes to one of these house meetings to show up. And when he knocks on the door and Rhoda answers the door, she looks at him. She can't believe that it's Peter. And so she goes back in and she tells her friends that are in there. And they say, no, you're crazy. It has to be his angel. I thought they didn't have a lot of faith. They couldn't even believe it when he was there. So they... But you know what? I understand this because in 1979 when I was really sick and I was in the Health Science Center in Winnipeg and I had to have major surgery, my husband was going through a faith crisis uh, as a result of this because we had people everywhere praying for, for, um, for healing for me. And when he was in this waiting room when, when I was undergoing surgery, there was a man in there and in the waiting room with him, and he had his hands buried in his face, and he was really in a lot of, a lot of uh, crisis, pain, and so on in his own life. And when he was in there, uh, the Holy Spirit spoke to my husband and said, go and talk to him, and even told him what he should say to him. And so my husband went and talked to him, and he ended up leading him to the Lord, and then he found himself saying, well, this, he, he found himself saying this to him, the same God that saved you tonight can heal your wife. And then afterwards, he was so shocked that he said that, and he was like, yeah, right, and here's my wife going through what she's going through. And he was just was like, had no faith. It was faithless faith, but he found himself saying these five words, please heal this man's wife as he just kind of dribbled off his lip. But you know what? That night God showed him something about faith. That God did a miracle, and she was instantly healed, and she came out of her coma, and uh, the doctors found nothing wrong with her. You see, even faithless prayers can get results when God's Holy Spirit empowers them. Amen. And then we have no faith or little faith is mentioned in the Bible. Jesus was in the boat with his disciples, and a great windstorm arose, and waves were filling the boat with water, and Jesus was asleep in it. And when they showed fear, Jesus questioned why they had no faith in Mark's account. And in Matthew's, he said, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Well, how would you have fared in that storm when the waves were rolling up over you and so on? Would you be faith-filled? Would you be, have, have uh, little faith? Would you have no faith? Would you have fear? You know, sometimes we can judge these guys, but where would we be, right? And then there's visible faith. And this is the story in Luke of the men who lowered the paralytic through the roof to get Jesus. And it says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to them, man, your sins are forgiven you. And God can see our faith too. He can see our faith in in what we say, in what we do, and what we think about. And others can too. Is your faith visible today? 
Okay, then there's strong faith. And God refers to this in Romans to Abraham, how he wasn't wavering at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strengthened in his faith. It wasn't always strong, but it grew strong, the scripture says, as he hoped against hope. And that's really encouraging for us, isn't it? Because if Abraham can grow his faith, so can we. And then there's active faith. And James and in Mark talks about this. But someone will say, you have faith and you have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Because faith without works is dead. You see, the woman in the crowd with the issue of blood, who pressed through the crowd to touch the hem of Jesus' garment, she put her faith in Jesus to heal her into action. She pressed through to get the results. And the Bible goes on to talk about precious faith, rich faith, perfect faith, shipwreck faith, overcoming and victorious faith, and holy faith. So we see how important that faith is to the believer's walk in Christ. As you sit here today, where are you in those categories of faith? You know, I think we can all identify with all of them, right, at some point in our, in our journey with the Lord. But I'd like to experience great faith and strong faith more often, wouldn't you? Okay, well, how do you get that faith? I've only got time to talk about two areas today, but I think they're the main ones that the Bible says where we get faith from. And first of all, number one, it's given by God. The Bible talks about us in Romans that we're not to think more highly of ourselves, but to think soberly because God has given each one of us a measure of faith. So scripture here is teaching that faith isn't just conjured up by the human will, but it's a sovereignly granted gift of God. And Jesus said in John 6, 15, no one, no one can come to me unless it has been granted of him from the Father. Ephesians 2, 8 to 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So the very faith necessary even to believe God is also provided by the grace of God to all who will receive it. And in Philippians it says, To you it has been granted for Christ's sake to believe in him. And now when Peter was writing about the fellow believers, he says, Fellow believers as those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. You see, they received that gift. Well, how do we know that faith is is, uh, God's gift to us? Well, just think about it. If we were left to ourselves, would we really believe? The scripture says, There is none who understands. There is none who seeks God. So I'm grateful today, aren't you, that God has given us this gift of faith. And secondly, faith comes from the word of God. Our God is not silent. He speaks. And when I'm talking about the word of God, I'm talking about both the Logos word of God and the Rhema word of God. Now the Logos That's the written word of God. That's a record of God speaking to mankind. It's all the arguments, the data, the message, the revelation of God in the world. And the, the Bible talks about Jesus being God. Jesus is the Logos incarnate in human form. In John 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the word, that's the Logos, and the word, Logos, was God, and the word, was with God, sorry, and the word was God. And so as we read the written word, as we read the Bible, as we read the Logos, our faith grows as we, and we get to know more about Jesus. We read and apply God's word to our life and, and our faith grows. But the rhema, that's a spoken word. That's a word that's communicated by the Holy Spirit. And in Matthew 4, when Jesus was countering each temptation by Satan with the spoken word, he said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. That's the rhema. That's the spoken word. Every spoken word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You see, we need the written word as our foundation to stand on, but we also need the spoken word uh, to give us direction, to know what to do, and where to go for a specific time in a specific situation. 
Jesus himself listened for the voice of the God, uh, the voice of God as Father. Jesus, before his impending death, said, "For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken." And other times he would say he could do nothing on his own, only what he was told to do or what he saw the Father doing. And as Jesus waited on God to hear from him, he would have faith then. His faith would be built to carry out his purpose in every situation he faced in his life on earth. But the great news today is that the Holy Spirit is here for us also. We can also hear from the Holy Spirit. Because John 16, 13 says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You see, hearing from the Holy Spirit empowers us. And it gives us boldness to what God is asking of us. We have faith to believe for the impossible. I think the most exciting thing in my life that I can think of is when I hear from the Holy Spirit. I love hearing from the Holy Spirit. You see, God can take the written Logos word and he can make it personally speak to us as a rhema word at a specific occasion for a specific reason. But also God's word spoken to you and me can be a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom from the Holy Spirit that builds faith. I want to tell you a recent story. I told this to uh, our ministry partners and some of our pastoral staff. So you've heard my story, but the rest in here haven't. Uh, This was back in March and I picked up a I picked up a virus and I and I had a fever uh, for three days that was about 101 and it was just really dragging me out and you know I like I'm a busy person I like to do things and I was just feeling I couldn't do anything but lay around and I was just so fatigued I was just getting kind of discouraged with it and I just I just uh, went and I took my temperature and I thought, oh no, it's 101 again. And I was just blah, feeling like this. And I walked into to the washroom. And when I was in the bathroom, would you believe that's where the Holy Spirit speaks to me? He can speak to you anywhere. So he, uh, he spoke to me. And this is what, what he said. He said, Linda, he said, you're always speaking to things in the name of Jesus. Why don't you speak to that fever and tell it to leave in the name of Jesus? Oh, okay. So I said, fever, in the name of Jesus, I command you to leave my body right now and don't return. And I yelled that right out in the bathroom. And then I went, oh, I have to tell you, I went right after that and I took my temperature. Guess what it was? Completely normal. Completely normal. Oh, that was so awesome. And it was just like day and night. My husband came home and I said, Dave, I'm totally fine. I've been totally fine since around 1 o'clock today. And that's when I told the devil to take off. I had the power because I had the name of Jesus. And I had the word there because I had prayed for myself earlier. (laughs) You see, um, God can empower us. Um, Then let's look at the healing of a lame man at Beautiful Gate. In Acts 3, I just want to paraphrase this. A lame man crippled from birth was laid every day at the gate of the temple to beg for alms. Peter and John, he must have passed by there. They must have passed by there several times because they were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer. So I don't think that that was the only day that they went to the temple at the hour of prayer. But why did they engage this lame man at the gate at that time? Well, let's read this in Acts 3, 4, 8. It should be on the screen. And fixing his eyes on him, on the beggar, with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And when the people that were there saw that, the Bible says that they were all amazed at what just happened. And so they started to come and crowd around this, this lame man who was now healed and around Peter 
But notice Peter's response in verse 12 and 16. Verse 12, he says, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us, as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? And then verse 16, this is, this is the answer why that man walked that day. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. See, there's two things about faith here. There is, first of all, there is faith in the name of Jesus expressed, but they received that faith from God. It was a gift from God. Peter and John had heard a rhema word of knowledge from God that day, and that was what was different than all the other days. They had received a gift of faith, the faith which comes from God to say, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give you because they knew that day they had it. They had Holy Spirit empowered faith. Well, let's look at the Hebrews Hall of Fame for a little bit. Because hearing from God can build great faith in ordinary men and women. And nothing inspires faith like hearing the voice of God. It gives us a sense of destiny, gives us a sense of purpose for our lives. And whatever calling that we may have in life, It's going to take faith. I just finished reading the book of Hebrews a few weeks back, and it's all about Christians persevering in their faith. And that's what stirred me even for this message today. Because Hebrews chapter 11 is all about the heroes of the faith. They are in God's hall of fame. You know, my husband, um, he's listed in the Manitoba Sports Hall of Fame for his canoe paddling in, in uh, 1967. And if you look at the back wall there, all those banners are, well, they're kind of Joel's and all the Harvest City Christian Academy Sports Team's Hall of Fame. You know, but wouldn't you want to be in that great cloud of witnesses someday that are in God's Hall of Fame? You see, Hebrews 11 speaks of ordinary men and women who God had pressed his claim upon their lives, who heard his voice in some way, who responded in faith to what they heard. And notice that God was the initiator. He was the apprehender, and he spoke to them. And the Holy Spirit empowered faith caused a number of things to happen in their lives. And in reading this, I I just want to share some of those things I found in this chapter. First of all, it caused them to believe without seeing. Hebrews 11, 7, it says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. You see, not all faith involves building a boat in the middle of a desert or in the middle of dry ground. But it always involves taking God at his word and proceeding according to what he says is going to happen, even when it seems really strange and unbelievable to you. I remember years ago in the late 70s when God called us to plant a church in Swan River A number of strange and unbelievable things happened to us in that time, and I don't have time to tell them to you all, but, you know, if if they hadn't have happened, if God hadn't have spoke to us the way he did, we wouldn't have been able to step out and do that. We wouldn't have had the faith to do it. But one of those things, I just want to share with you one of the stories, is one night Dave and I were praying, and Dave was still teaching school at the time, and, uh, and, and we could sense God pressing his claim in our lives, but we didn't know what he was saying, what he wanted us to do. And we were praying together. And as we were praying in our living room, Dave says, and I was praying, Dave said, Linda, stop, stop, stop. I said, what? He said, Linda, he said, when you're praying, he said, I, I had this vision or this picture or something. I don't know how to describe it. He said, I, I saw myself, he said, and I, I saw myself kind of from the waist down. And he said, I had these three millstones, great big things on my legs. And he said, and, and as I was walking, I could see myself in my view. And he said, these things were just dragging on me. And I was, my walk was being impeded. And, and he said, I, I don't know what this means. And I said, oh, that's different, Dave. I said, well... And we were all new in the things of the Holy Spirit at that time. 
And so I said, well, Dave, why don't we, and we had more faith too, let me tell you. I said, he said, I said, why don't we just ask the Lord for a word of knowledge and give us an interpretation? So we went back to prayer again and, Lord, what does that mean? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, these are the three millstones. The youth group, the interdenominational youth group that Dave and I were, were leading in the Swan River Valley at the time, the, the evangelical church that we were part of, and Dave's teaching job were those three millstones on the lake, and all of those were hindering our walking God. Well, how could that be? We did not understand. We didn't know what was going on. After all, we were experiencing success in those. But then a few weeks later, God did another thing. He gave us this vision of, of an egg coming down in a birth canal and opening up in a mound of flesh. And he said, I'm giving birth to a new work here in the valley. And so we had a number of other things too. But, but those things, hearing the voice of the Lord in that, caused us to believe without seeing and to step out and to start a church. Then in coming to Regina in 1987, and some of you, most of you have heard the story when the Holy Spirit uh, showed up um, in, in Dave's car when he was coming back from Portland, Oregon, and spoke to Dave and said, you will go to Regina and you will pastor Maranatha Christian Center, which was the name of this church in years gone by. Well, why? Why would the Holy Spirit say that? We were happy in Swan River, and, and Dave was only home a short time and God showed us the why. And it wasn't for good reasons. And some suffering was involved in our lives as well as in those we were coming to. But in both stories, we heard from God and we believe without seeing. You see, faith bids us to move forward. You know, a mature faith steps out and doesn't quit until the dream is realized. And secondly, what else it did for these people in, in the Hall of Fame? It caused them to obey without understanding. Hebrews 11.8 says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would afterward receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. See, the language is in the present tense. As he was being called, he went. The response was immediate. He went from a comfortable, established lifestyle in Ur to following a God he barely knew to a place he never knew. And sometimes, folks, we just have to take a risk and just believe that God knows what he's doing even when we don't. We're all doing that for this coming weekend, right? <laughs> you know, I remember back in those days, Dave was teaching school and we had saved up enough money to, to put a down payment on a house. And we were so looking forward to We picked out this house. It was in our price range. We had our down payment. We were all ready to go to give it to the, to the owner of this house. When that evening, the Holy Spirit started giving us a check and saying, I don't want you to put your money in that house. And we didn't understand. But we called the woman up and we said, I'm sorry, but we, can't, uh, we, we don't think this is the timing for us to buy a house. Because the reason was, is God knew that he was going to ask us to give that money that we were going to buy the house for. He was going to ask us to put that money towards building a fourplex that would house a Christian school and three other families in the Swan River Valley at that time. You see, if our obedience depends upon always understanding the why of God's command, our faith needs to grow. And thirdly, it caused them to do right without feeling good about it. You see, Moses, it says about Moses, by faith, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Why would you do something that brings you pain? Why would you do something that causes you to suffer? Why would you turn away from things that make you feel good, especially for something you cannot see? Yet understood or not, faith is choosing to do right when we don't necessarily feel like it. I didn't feel like coming to Regina in 1987. I tried to talk my husband out of it, and I cried all the way here from Swan River. But you know what? I knew that I knew it was the will of God. And because it was the will of God, where else could I go? What else could I do? 
He holds the words to life, right? And then number four, it says, I I wrote here, it caused them to trust without receiving right away. In Hebrews 11.30, it says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. God told Joshua and the people to take the city. But instead of laying siege to it in the normal way, they were told to go out and march around it, not uttering a sound, with priests blowing trumpets, and then return to camp. And they had to do that for seven days. Don't you think they probably felt a little stupid out there, marching around, and, you know, looking up at the people at the wall, looking down on them, marching around? You know, if I was there, I'd probably be looking for a shield as I marched around. You see... It seemed really crazy to them. And especially when they had to go back to the camp each day without God doing anything. After six days, they were probably wondering, where is God? Why isn't he answering our prayers? Why isn't he doing something? If God could do it on the seventh day, why couldn't he on the first day or at least on the second or third? You know, faith is the hardest of all, isn't it? on those days between hearing from God and receiving the promise. But do we trust God when we haven't received the answer yet? That's that's what faith, that's what faith is all about. Hebrews 6.12 says, Through faith and patience we inherit the promises of God. And as you read Hebrews 11, from verse 4 to 31, we read, By faith Abel, by faith Enoch, by faith Noah, by faith Abraham, by faith Sarah, by faith Isaac, by faith Jacob, by faith Joseph, by faith Moses, by faith Rahab. And then, if that's not enough, in verse 32 to 35, we hear more of heroes of the faith. And it says, And what more shall I say, for time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead race to life again. Wow! What faith they had! What faith, amen? Wow! Well, then we hear of the other's company. Let's look at verse 35 to 38. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still, others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword, They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. You know, when I read that, even when it said, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that means that they were given a choice to deny their faith, right? But they didn't. They chose not to because they wanted to obtain a better resurrection. Well, what's the matter with these guys? Did they have sin in their lives? Didn't they have enough faith? Oh, yes, they did. They had great, great, great faith in my mind. Holy Spirit-empowered faith. And number five, and this is my last point, it caused them to go on without fulfillment. A lot of faithful people are mentioned who died before God fulfilled his promise to bless their lives. One more story from my past. We had a man in our church, his name was Ed, and he got terminal cancer. And we had prayed for his wife years earlier. In fact, she was the first person that my my husband ever prayed for for healing when when somebody who was mentoring him told him to go and lay hands on him. He was scared out of his mind, but he laid his hands on her, and her heart was healed, and she lived into her late 90s. And so because 
Her heart was healed. Here is her husband got cancer. Well, of course, God's going to do this again. He's going to heal Ed. Ed believed that he would. Our whole church, our Christian school, we, we, we all believed this would happen. Uh, and we, as a church and a school, we never prayed so hard in our lives as we prayed for Ed. Day and night, we set up these watches. The, the, the students had all scriptures and everything posted all over his hospital room. And, 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 and we were just, we believed for this miracle. And I still remember how tired I was walking around my kitchen trying to pray in the middle of the night when it was my turn. We felt convinced that God would heal him. After all, the scripture says the prayer of faith will heal the sick, right? And we had faith. Well, as time passed, Ed was in his last hours of life. And Dave and I were praying for him that night at the hospital with his wife. Our assistant pastor came up to take his shift and to pray with him. And Dave said to him, if Ed dies, raise him from the dead. And so that's the way we felt. And we were only home a couple of hours. And the sun was coming up. And the phone rang. And our assistant said, Ed is gone. Well, Dave says, raise him from the dead. I'm coming. I'll be right there. And so Dave and I got in the car. We, we, we got into the hospital room. And we tried to raise him from the dead. And it didn't happen. And our faith crashed. His wife had told us that God had given her the scripture in the night. That weeping may endure for the night. But joy comes in the morning. And she received it as God's word of comfort. But it didn't comfort us. We were feeling we mustn't have had enough faith. But then, a while later, after we were just in that chapel, just lost and like God, feeling so let down. What's wrong with us? Then our assistant pastor came into the chapel where we were in our faith crisis, and he had a verse for us. And it was this portion of scripture in Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. I saw on the screen, and all of these, that was the other's company, though they won divine approval by means of their faith, did not receive the fulfillment of what was promised because God had us in mind and had something better and greater in view for us so that they, these heroes and heroines of the faith, should not come to perfection apart from us before we could join them. You see, God spoke to our hearts that night in the chapel that we had won his divine approval by our faith. We had done what he'd asked us to do because God honors and he expects faith from us. We had believed him. We had exercised faith, and that pleased him. He approved us that morning in the chapel, and our crisis lifted. God is sovereign. He had something better in mind, something eternal. You know, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they said, God is able to deliver us from the furnace of the blazing fire, but even if he does not, we are not going to worship the golden image. They were confident that God was trustworthy, even if he did not deliver them in this life. Are we? Can we say like Job in Job 13, 15, though he slay me, yet will I trust him? That's what God spoke to me in the health science center when I was just a young woman. Would I trust him? I felt slain. But I'm here. (laughs) I'm here all these years later. The devil, I got the last laugh on the devil. (laughs) Holy Spirit empowered faith is declaring him to be good when suffering abounds. 
We exhibit faith when we trust in the wisdom and the logic of his grand plan, that which we cannot clearly understand, and even though we dislike its details. We exhibit faith when we rest in the knowledge that all the goodness we genuinely desire is waiting for us in heaven, even if it never materializes on earth. Holy Spirit-empowered faith gives us a better understanding of thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not my kingdom, not my, not my, not my will, but thine. And what James was talking about when he says, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. I thought as a charismatic guy, I could never use that scripture. Holy Spirit-empowered faith trusts in the sovereignty of God. True faith is all about total surrender to God's purposes. Surrender. That's the big word, surrender. Holy Spirit-empowered faith in God does not insulate you from encountering life's problems. But it does ensure that you come out of every situation as the victor and not the victim. Amen? Amen. So this morning, church, let's raise our faith in God. Let's be God-pleasers so that when the Son of Man comes and he says, will I find faith here on the earth? I think he's talking about these last days because he knows that the faith level of people isn't going to be what it should be. But let's not let him find us with no faith in our hearts this morning. Amen. 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 Joel. Why don't you stand to your feet this morning? That was awesome. How many of you are glad I didn't preach this morning? (laughs) Let's close in prayer. I know that that message spoke to you, challenged you, did me. Let's just lift our hands to heaven and let's just ask the Holy Spirit for faith. Holy Spirit, we come to you today recognizing we need you and the faith that only you can inspire and provoke and stir in us. Lord, we can't fabricate it. Only you can give it to us. Lord, you see the situations that we're facing that require faith. And God, where we're weak in faith, Lord, would you help us? Lord, we're like those disciples. We believe, help our unbelief. We believe, help our unbelief. And so God, today, we just say, we we need to hear a word. We want the rhema word of God. Lord, if there's anything that I'm provoked in this morning is I want to live by that rhema word of God. Every day, I want to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit that empowers me in all those situations that I face. Lord, I believe we all have that heart today. And so, God, I pray that even every day we would awake and just say, Holy Spirit, come on, speak to me a word today. In the middle of all the noise, Lord, there is so much noise. The enemy is whispering every day. There's just noise coming from everywhere. Holy Spirit, would you speak in the middle of the noise? In the middle of the storms, would there be a word from God that would be an anchor in our soul, that would give us the strength we need for the situations that we face? Lord, we trust you today. We both trust in your sovereignty. We surrender ourselves to you today. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, be blessed. Be blessed, church. Uh, Hang out there in the foyer. If you need some tickets to invite somebody to come together on the weekend, we still have tickets out there that you can use to pass around. It's going to be an awesome time.
update on all the exciting things happening at our church. Here at Harvest City, we're all about connecting with our community and celebrating those big moments. Like if you've recently decided to fully dedicate your life to Jesus, we'll be your cheerleaders and help you take those first steps. And if you're going through a tough season, let us know how we can help you. Plus, we've got tons of programs for kids, youth, and adults if you're looking for a new community to be part of. To send us a message or check out more about HCC, head over to our website, harvestcity.ca. To all of our financial partners, thank you for investing into the kingdom of God. Your generosity allows us to keep doing what we're called to do and reach even more people. If you're interested in contributing, please visit harvestcity.ca slash giving for more info. Thanks for being here. Keep living your call and we'll catch you again soon.